All right, we're, we're wrapping it up today, and we're going to end with the best of best, right? So, uh, the <laughs> Hopefully, final speaker. right? And very pleased to have Jason Oliver here with us today. Uh, Jason is at Cornell University. Uh, he is working with the Pro Dairy team, uh, microbiology area. I, I get missing your information here. Mm -hmm. So maybe give us a quick old introduction to yourself, Jason. Sure, yeah. So I'm a sort of microbiologist by training, but I've been working on a lot of sort of ag, waste management issues, biofilters, denitrified bioreactors, uh, biogas cleanup systems that are biological. Um, and on this antibiotic resistance project too. So. All right, um, do we need to get this rolling here? Oh, so. yes. All right, I work with Kurt, as many of you probably know, um, and we're collaborators on this uh, interdisciplinary, inter-institutional project looking at antimicrobial resistance in dairy systems and uh, sort of the big goal is to see if we can identify certain manure treatment processes that might be good at breaking down some of these residues. Um, so to give a little background, uh, antibiotics are chemicals that inhibit the growth or can actually kill bacterial cells. So they have kind of a narrow definition. Um, and they are produced naturally and I think that's an important thing to say because um, you know, a lot of people think these are sort of like these uh, anthropogenic pollutants, um, but, you know, bugs in the soil produce them, that's where we discovered them. Um, but they are also manufactured in a big way by pharmaceutical companies, and they're used in all sorts of applications for human health, livestock health, I mean, they're sprayed on orchards, um, so they have a lot of, a lot of uses. Um, and antibiotic resistance is also sort of a natural process um, by which bacteria, through the exposure to antibiotics and mutations, can resistant and over time um, sort of a population can be selected to become more resistant. Uh, so I kind of put this little schematic together. So if you think of a population of bacteria, you might have one, say our orange bacteria here that's resistant. And so if you're using antibiotics to sort of, you know, on that population, you might be going after an infection causing your sort of purple bacteria. Um, you might also kill some untargeted bacteria, say our blues and our greens. So when you're done using these antibiotics, the bugs that are left then have the ability to sort of start reproducing. And so over time, you can kind of select for a population that's more resistant. And uh, this was alluded to in the talk before, there's also this uh, phenomena where um, bacteria can horizontally transfer their genes. Um, so unrelated species can literally put their genetic information into the environment and that can be picked up by a different bacteria. Um, and often on these plasmids that they're called that are sort of carrying this genetic information. It's, you can have antibiotic resistance, but you might also have metal tolerance or these other sort of stress tolerance genes. So um, even sometimes when there isn't antibiotics present in the environment, you can sort of get this, this pickup of genetic information. And ultimately what, what's happening is this is resulting in sort of the loss of effectiveness of these antibiotic drugs. And, and you know, everyone's heard of MRSA and there's increasing difficulties in hospitals and even some livestock systems to treat infections because of antibiotic resistance. Um, so there's a big misconception, I think, a lot of times, and I think this cartoon's really funny, and I think for the animal science people in the audience, there are some things that maybe aren't quite accurate here. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, there, in, in addition to just maybe the cow not having the right physiology, um, one thing is these are not monster bugs. These are natural bacteria that just have the ability to resist antibiotics. And then this idea of overuse of antibiotics, I think it's, it's easy to point the finger to the livestock industry because there certainly is a lot of use, but I think we also really lack good data on where antibiotics are being used. Um, we don't have good data on their usage in humans. Uh, the FDA is collecting data on um, livestock, um, but you know, that data is slim. So um, I've seen anywhere from 40 to 80% is used by livestock and poultry, and this can also depend on if you're counting ionophores as an antibiotic or antimicrobial, um, but potentially, you know, significant use. Um, there's also been some efforts to look globally at um, livestock use, and this is based on sales data and then sort of modeling it in regions where there isn't good data. Um, so by and large, it, it seems like, you know, the cattle, dairy component are maybe using less 
um, maybe hogs and chickens a bit more, but again, we don't have good numbers on this. Um, and if you do look at the human use data, the other thing, you know, these tend to be reported in milligrams of active compound. Um, any reports I've seen for humans, it's also on a, a standard unit, so it's a by pill basis. So you can't even really compare numbers to numbers a lot of times. Um, what we do know also is that nationally, about 60% of the dairies are using antibiotics to treat their sort of young stock and heifers. Um, and about 90% are using it on cows. And that percentage is higher often because of the dry off treatments that are used. Uh, we also have a big unknown range about excretion rates, and I've seen anywhere from 20 to 90 percent in the literature, and there hasn't really been any focused research, um, especially anything of recently, so maybe for some of you nutritionists and animal science, there's some potential here to look at these excretion rates. Um, but ultimately, you know, there is uh, residues that end up in manure. Um, and there are some ways to reduce this. Um, one thing uh, that's really important is cow environment, right? So if we have better ventilated buildings, we're really good at keeping up on good bedding, you know, keeping the manure and urine out of these buildings, you can reduce the incidence of infection, thereby reducing the usage of antibiotics and reducing your residues. Um, so, you know, farm hygiene in the milk parlor, things like that, also can really help the spread of disease and reduce your antibiotic usage. Um, there's also, in the vet community, a, a real interest in sort of optimizing use. So we're starting to, you know, not me, but vets that we work with are starting to look at selective treatments. So if you identify the actual causal agent of the infection of mastitis, in some cases it maybe doesn't make sense to use antibiotics because the cow might heal the infection just as fast with or without. In other cases it might make sense to just call the animal because the antibiotics are never going to beat that infection. Um, there's also this new veterinary feed directive where they're trying to get veterinarians back involved in the process of administering drugs via feed and water to sort of prevent this growth promotion use of antibiotics. Um, and then, you know, some people avoid antibiotic use, which is another strategy, um, but there are consequences there, as alluded to earlier, about animal health. So, I mean, in some cold climates, you might have up to 25% of your young stock die of pneumonia if you're not using antibiotics. So there's these sort of trade-offs there. Um, and then the other piece is, you know, when, when all these other measures to reduce aren't there, you know, what's sort of the fate and mitigation potential? And this is where Kurt and I have kind of gotten involved. Um, so this is a little busy, but it's sort of a background of the entire project here. So we're working, um, like I said, with a few different institutions. Uh, the U Buffalo team is sort of our uh, chemistry lab and doing some of the genetics work. Uh, Kurt and I, and then the Maryland group are sort of the boots on the ground people working closely with the farms, collecting samples, doing some analysis of the manure treatment systems, making sure they're you know working well. And then the Michigan team is also sort of uh, on the genetic side looking at some of the antibiotic resistance genes. Um, so at six farms in New York, two in Pennsylvania, and three in Maryland, we are collecting manure pre and post all these different treatment steps. So here's some just basic schematics. So a farm might have a blunt pit and a mixed digester, liquid separation, some post-solids treatment. Uh, they might just have a pit in the long-term storage. So we're collecting samples before and after a diversity of different um, you know, handling systems and sort of looking for antibiotic residues, um, looking at some of the resistant bacteria, ARBs, and the resistant genes. Um, there's also some trials looking at you know, you know, little digester manipulations. And we're also collecting antibiotic usage data because it doesn't do us a lot of good to just sample manure if we don't kind of have some idea what's going in, so. Um, so speaking, we'll start here with the usage. It's a busy table, but this kind of gives you some idea of the diversity of antibiotics used on farms and um, the different classes and the types so these numbers in here are representing out of the six farms in New York, you know, maybe in this case five of them are using Spectre mass to treat a mastitis infection. So, you know, maybe unlike some of the efforts to really standardize feed rations and things, there's not a whole lot of standardization of what antibiotics are being used for what infection. I think it tends to be driven a lot by who your vet is, who your drug salesperson is. Um, and the other thing to note here is, uh, hopefully you can see the colors, but according to the World Health Organization, they sort of rank antibiotics based on how important they are to human health and, and how, um, you know, basically a ranking on antibiotic resistance. So uh, in the case of these red antibiotics, they're, um, you know, sort of the last 
drugs we have to treat certain infections. So they're important, really important to human health. And these yellow ones are sort of the next ranking. So you can see most of the antibiotics used by the dairy systems are also important to human health and you know, are, are, are of concern for antibiotic resistance. Um, you can also just sort of look at um, percentage-wise what these farms use, and in some cases, you know, we have maybe farms that are using kind of a similar, um, you know, recipe of, of antibiotics, if you will. So mostly penicillins here, tetracyclines at decent percentages. But then we have other farms that are, you know, very different from what they're using. So this has been in kind of eye-opening for us, and it's helped us target some of, you know, what antibiotics should we focus on. Um, and we're also trying to track this information over time. And it's important here because, um, as you can see, with you know, a particular farm, they had a, a bad respiratory outbreak, and so all of a sudden their use of uh, penicillins went way up in just this particular month. So if we're just sampling manure and we have this high point, I mean, what's that mean? So we're trying to sort of track it back to what's happening on the farm. Um, and here's just sort of an average, so, you know, just dividing cows and usage, we can have pretty significant amounts of antibiotics being used on some of these farms. Um, so looking at the fate of antibiotic residues, um, basically what our effort has been to kind of go out about every six weeks and sample at these different points on, a, on the, the treatment system. And what we're trying to do is take composite samples and samples over time to get you know, as representative of a, of a graph sample as we can on the day that we're out there. So repeated sampling, mixing, and then filling the various vials and tubes that go to all the different labs. Um, and then when you get into a pile like this, you know, we're taking composite samples, but you know, one thing we're doing a lot of, um, putting a lot of effort into right now is just you know, questioning how accurately we can actually detect these residues. Because if you're looking at this mountain of you know, separated solids here that's continually being generated, and then I'm filling a bucket with a few of these scoops, and then I'm filling some little tube, and then we're freeze drying that tube and sampling it for you know, a residue. So we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out you know, how can we be accurate, as accurate as we can, can possibly get. Um, for the antibiotics, um, the chemistry team is using a tandem MS approach, and uh, that's really important. I think I lost up here. But there's just, you know, some of these antibiotics, as they break down, they'll just lose a single side group. And so it's important to really have a high resolution uh, detection method for some of these, and that's sort of showing these two different peaks side by side. So we can, we can resolve just slight changes as the in the chemicals as they break down. Um, and initially, we sort of focused on uh, these group of drugs because that's the lab sort of had methods in place. But taking uh, collection data, we're finding that beta lactams and septiafurs are also of high use. So right now, what we're doing is using sort of an ELISA approach, just a quick screen to get some idea on concentrations while the lab's actually developing some new methodologies to, to look at more detail on those. Um, so what I'm going to do now is share some preliminary findings, but also share a little bit of background on, on the um, litter trend because we're um, you know new to this and I think really the field is kind of new in general um, but we are seeing some detectable levels of tetracyclines and sulfonamides in the manure uh, trace levels of macrolides and then right now sort of positive detections of penicillins and semifers so we are seeing antibiotics getting into these manure pits um, we're also doing some detection of bedded packs, and we are seeing some antibiotics in there that tend to be low, and it could be sort of a dilution factor because of all the bedding. Um, in area of compost, we're seeing levels actually tend to drop from what they are in the raw manure, so maybe um, this process could be promising. You know, we've got a lot more work to do. Um, and we're also looking at sort of rotary drum, more sophisticated composting units, and we're also seeing lower levels there. Um, so based on the literature, what I've seen is, you know, it could take a few months for antibiotic levels to sort of drop below, you know, any, you know, have some big drop, a 90% drop. Um, and more, you know, aggressively managed compost, it could happen in a couple of weeks. Um, but for certain antibiotics, you know, over time, you might only get 5 to 70% total reduction in these systems. Um, and generally what I've seen is sort of higher temperature, more aeration, you get more breakdown. Um, they've, there's also a little bit of work looking at the resistant bacteria and resistant genes, and they are seeing some breakdown in these systems too. 
Um, so with the anaerobic digesters, I, I really can't say a whole lot right now because it's, it's complex. <laughs> We're seeing numbers kind of jump all over the place. We're really trying to track the flow of manure through these systems and track the performance of these digesters. And so we've got a lot of work to do, you know, especially some of these continuously mixed systems, like what's going in is exactly what's coming out and how do, how do we actually trace these through and, and assess the performance of these systems. Um, and we are, you know, like I said, taking performance data. If someone's using co-substrates, we're tracking those loads and what's going in and out. And um, we also have, you know, frozen archives. So we have the potential to kind of look at the microbial community and the digesters too. Um, the literature on this um, also has, um, I, I guess there's sort of two, two ends to this, because um, just as you were saying in the field, how do the antibiotics maybe affect microbial communities? You know, if you shock load too much antibiotics into a digester, you can actually crash it. Um, so that tends to be dose dependent. So low doses the digesters can handle, high doses you could actually, you know, inhibit biogas production. Um, and then digesters looking at sort of the breakdown of the antibiotics, if anywhere from, you know, I've seen 20 to 100 percent reductions. These are mostly lab scale trials. Um, usually a pretty good reduction in the resistant bacteria because you have this big community shift. Um, but sometimes modest reductions in, in the actual genes. Um, but again, sort of higher uh, temperature systems tend to have more breakdown. Um, separation, what we're, well, we are seeing some sort of partitioning. So we'll see levels a little lower in solids and maybe a little higher in liquids. Uh, sometimes that's reversed. Um, but this really is driven by these drug solubilities. And as we were talking to a minute ago, they can not only are arranged throughout these different classes of antibiotics, but even just within a class, different antibiotics can have very different solubilities. And typically, the more soluble it is, the more mobile, but also the more sort of available for biodegradation. Um, and then in storage, I, I, you know, we are detecting levels sort of, you know, through these treatment systems. We're still getting some drug, drug residues here, but, you know, so what does this mean? You know, is it, is this trace level too high? How does it compare to a background sample? What is a good background sample? What's a control? These are questions we're kind of getting at. There's not been a whole lot of um, research here. Um, there's some evidence in these anaerobic systems you don't get great breakdown, but um, these are things we're trying to work out. Um, and then in the field, just sharing some literature stuff. So our work's at this point sort of ending at the field, even though we are going to be doing some small crop uptake studies. Um, but in dairy ecosystems, they tend to see this upregulation of resistance genes. They are finding um, resistant um, bacteria. They're finding, you know, drug residues are being detected. Um, so, you know, there is a potential issue here, but, you know, how serious it is and how much that's, you know, impacting drug resistance is kind of to be determined. Um, so we also have some ongoing work actually looking right at the resistant bacteria. So we're doing some culture-based efforts to actually grow mastitis pathogens and harvest those colonies so we can actually look at the resistance of these mastitis pathogens. Um, we have a big sequencing effort going on, looking at some select samples so we can see sort of what is this resist zone or the sort of whole community of resistance genes and which ones are maybe at higher abundance and that's helping us target some more detailed work. And then um, Stephanie Lansing's team has these pilot digesters that we're going to employ, and uh, as I mentioned, some growth chamber experiments looking at crop uptake of some drug residues. And then Kurt and I have been developing some outreach materials and uh, things like that as well. So with that, I'll take any questions. Questions for Jason? We did leave a very interesting study to the end, so very good. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Here we go. You, you have a table there that has different water solubilities. Yeah. Do you have any idea on what the half-life on those things would be in open environments? Yeah, I mean, there are half-lives, and they they're, they range. And a lot of times, this, that half-life half -life data comes from some real focused lab scale trials. Um, so I don't know if we really have a good idea of you know how long it might last in the field. I have seen studies that say, you know, up to 10 years after a land might stop being um, you know, used with manure applications, they still see some elevation in the resistance genes. Not so much in the drug residues, but there's sort of some memory in the bacterial community of, you know, they hold on to that resistance for a while, potentially. But I mean, there's few studies, there's not a whole lot of data out there. 
So was there another question back here? I was wondering if the um, correlation of the, you mentioned that higher temperature um, tends to kill or, or break down. What about moisture? If, if we're able to keep these facilities drier or, or if it's a more moist manure, more moist, is there any correlation there? Have you looked hmm. at that at all? No, I mean, we have, and we're collecting, you know, we're characterizing all these manure samples. So, I mean, these are some of the, you know, big, big analyses we hope to do towards the end. We have, you know, all the drug residue and resistance information, and then compare that to, you know, the nutrient content and the moisture contents of these different manures. But we haven't looked at that. I would suspect, you know, if it's dry or it's more aerobic, and you might get some breakdown, maybe, you know, in a bedded pack before it moves out or something like that. But, yeah, we're not, you know, I don't have any real conclusive evidence at this point. We had a study where we were looking at feedlot soils and trying to correlate different tetracyclines and the breakdown products to various factors. And, and moisture, you would think there'd be something there that there'd be a sweet spot. It was just all over the board. Mm -hmm. So it, at least out in a, in a, cat, in a beef cattle system, mm -hmm. it didn't seem to affect the feedlot. Do you have, okay, go ahead, please. Uh, it's less a, a technical question and more a project question, but you're asking some pretty um, sensitive questions of producers to, to hand over all of their um, uh, antimicrobial use data, mm -hmm. et cetera. How, how, how willing are the uh, producers do that and how are you protecting their confidentiality? Yeah, so, I mean, we're guaranteeing <coughs> confidentiality. And um, willingness, I think, is sort of a two part piece here. I think, for one, Kurt has done a great job building good relationships and trust with a lot of our producers. But I think the second part there is we've got some progressive producers that realize that this is a sensitive topic but would rather have some data in their back pocket before the community gets really upset about it. We have uh, this one particular farmer, and um, he's, he said this to us, and he's just like, I just want something accurate. And I think that's uh, something we kind of are striving for, is giving him something accurate. You know? So he's recognizing a potential issue, but he wants to know the facts. So you know, he can make a change if he can. You know, ideally, we can identify some kind of breakdown treatment system that would work great for these guys, and you know, maybe they'd be ready to spend the money if, if the issue you know, gets to that point. So are you also documenting, I heard you mentioned metabolized byproducts, are you also documenting them, trying to correlate them to some of the ARGs and ARBs? Yeah, I mean, so we're not just looking at, a, you know, the drug of use, but we're looking at the breakdown products. And, you know, I mean, there's a limit. At some point, it gets, the, these breakdown products are so small, it's hard to track. And um, But we are, you know, that's part of the uh, um, point of using the tandem MS approach, because you can really, get high resolution data and look at these different transformed um, drug residues and things like that. So. I have a question in terms of your opinion, I guess, mm -hmm. more than just based upon your experience and so yeah. on. But uh, for these my, antimicrobials that are uh, of high importance to human medicine, do we have enough of a smoking gun out there that we're going to have to change our ways in your opinion? Where are we at in terms of I mean, I think, that question? I mean, I think, you know, we as a community are, you know, need to change ways, not just livestock, but I mean, I've seen antibiotics in my toothpaste. It might not be necessary. You know, we use antibiotic soaps all the time to wash our hands. It's maybe not necessary. And so cutting back where we can will probably preserve some of these medicines that we need for when you do have a bad infection or if you need to have surgery or an organ transplant, you know. So I think it's going to be sort of this, you know, it's going to require a, a team effort. It's not going to be, you know, just a, a farm cutting back somewhere here and there. And I do think, you know, these efforts to get the vets back involved with, you know, feed and water usage of antibiotics will be really important to get that expertise back in there and, and sort of help help these producers go in the direction that they want to go. So do you think these direct this directing uh, is going to have a important value to us or is this just an interim step of multiple steps ahead? I think it's both, you know, I think it will be a value and 
Um, but it's you know a step on a you know on the way. Interesting topic, a lot to be learned ahead of us. Any last questions? <laughs>